morning. Oh, sorry, good afternoon. It's morning for me. Musician, actor, author, humanitarian, environmentalist, Sting writes, real art thrives in conditions of limitation, demanding improvisation, innovation, and creative problem solving. For many of you in this room who, in a few weeks, will be staring down the prospect of graduating, of moving on from the university and out into the larger world, Broken Music chronicles both the trials you will face as you struggle to maintain your voices and the grace that living an artistic life can bring. On behalf of all of us at the University of Wisconsin, the Department of English, and the Program in Creative Writing, please help me welcome Stan. Well, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm not sure I can follow it. But <laughs> maybe I should explain myself a little bit. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually playing here tonight. I have a concert here tonight with a, with a small band and a, a, a much um, reduced production. And it's, it's very much a sort of back to the roots uh, idea. I'm not quite sure why I'm doing it. But um, speaking to, to students, um, at these colleges I'm playing at, which I haven't done for 25, 30 years, is I suppose a way of reconnecting. I, I spend a lot of my time in the spotlight and I don't see very much up there. I, I just see the light. I know people are there. It's very difficult to contact them. So in a way you become very isolated from reality and uh, the more famous you are, the more successful you are, the more and more isolated you are. Witness poor Michael Jackson now, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. guilty or I don't know what, what he is, but uh, he's a person who's, who's isolated, deeply lonely, and I really fight against that all the time. I try and live a citizen's life. I, I pay tax, I have children, I, uh, I vote. I try and live as normal a life as possible. And I think the reason I'm doing this, I'm talking to you today, is to try and, you know, meet people's eyes and, and just have a normal discussion about something. Doesn't matter whether it's a book or something else. Yesterday I gave a, uh, a music class in um, Columbia, Missouri. And I talked about a little bit of music theory, a little bit of uh, song structure, and just what it's like to, to be a musician, a working musician. And that was good. So we, we alternate literary classes with music classes. Um, the reason I wrote this book is pr uh, probably the wrong reason. Uh, there had been many uh, so-called biographies written about me by people who'd never met me. Um, and I would have a sort of morbid curiosity about them. I'd pick them up in the bookshop and I'd <laughs> look, you know, and I, I'd get through them. But I, I didn't really recognize the person they were talking about because all of the stories they, they gleaned from tabloid um, newspapers, and some of them were true. <laughs> some of them weren't true. And, and so um, I, I really wanted to, I, I felt a little embittered that there was this industry happening around me, but not, a, not really me. And I thought that they were, they were trying to make me um, a much more uh, colorful character than I am. You know, the sort of archetypal rock star who throws TVs out the windows and, you know, makes love to thousands of women and um, all of this. And I've had a much more ordinary life than that. And yet my inner life is much more interesting than the one they could ever know. So I wanted to really reveal my inner life because I thought that was interesting and write not so much about uh, fame and celebrity and having tea with Elton John and all that stuff, which is fun, but the, my real life is, is, is in here. So um, I began the book in an odd way. I, it didn't begin, uh, I was born so and so. I, I began the book with an incident in 1988. I was in... Um, Brazil. I was on tour and I had the opportunity to have a, an experience. I suppose you'd call it a psychedelic experience. Now, I'm not, I'm not recommending that you have this experience, nor am I prescribing it. I, I'm, I'm just um, saying this happened to me and I found it very useful. You may find it useful too, or you may find it very dangerous or whatever. So that's, just, that's my disclaimer. <laughs> so. Um, it, it takes place in a church in the jungle, and um, I've read something about the potion they're going to give me, and I'm a little bit afraid, um, as you would be. And I think the passage will explain why I was afraid, because I, I was justified in my fear. The first indication that the potion is taking effect is the emergence of a high-pitched frequency inside my head, like a dog whistle, followed by an increasing numbness in my lips, 
and a distinct drop in my body temperature, I begin to shiver, gently at first, but with increasing intensity, standing at my feet and moving up my legs in wave after wave until my whole body is shaking violently. It is difficult to tell whether the shivering is a physi sorry, psychological reaction due to fear or simply that I'm cold. I'm conscious enough to know not to panic and to attempt to steady my breathing, but nausea wells in my throat and then proceeds to grip my stomach with increasing intensity until it feels like a writhing serpent inside of me trying to escape. It is all I can do to prevent myself from projectile vomiting. I grip the arms of the chair and breathe as deeply as I can. Something powerful and relentless is coursing through my entire body, through every blood vessel and artery, down the length of my arms to my toes and along the sinews of my arms. My fingers are shot with an alien energy. The foul taste that remains in my mouth seems like a physical analog of fear itself, and I realize I'm in the grip of some kind of chemical entity that, that is at this moment vastly more powerful than I am. The entire room seems to be gripped in the same visceral struggle. Some writhe in their seats, others have clearly capitulated, open-mouthed and corpse-like, while others seem calm and transfixed as if by beatific visions. Then as a bizarre counterpoint to the call of the thunder, the retching begins. I'd been warned of this, but nothing can quite prepare you for the piteous sound of this woeful, violent music, the music of abject physical misery. I am barely able to control my own intestinal tract as I watch others leave their seats to scramble unceremoniously for the door. Some make it, some do not. There are buckets of sawdust on hand to cover the offending pools of bile. Please let this pass. I don't want to throw up. I don't want to be embarrassed here. Please let this pass. The maestries who are in charge of this ceremony sit impassive and stoic in the center of the room as if this is the normal run of events. They too have partaken of the brew and in large doses, but do not seem to be succumbing to the growing nausea and discomfort in the room. Outside the nearest window, one tortured soul seems to be exorcising a relentless train of hideous demons from the bowels of his personal hell. I try stopping up my ears with my fingers and breathing deeply. I really can't take much more of this. I am no longer shivering, but the anaconda inside me is furious to leave my body. Beads of sweat begin to form on my face and chest, and my eyes roll back in my head. Did I really elect to do this? I must have been out of my mind. I've never felt this bad in my entire life, nor do I remember having been so afraid. Another peal of thunder compounds the agony. But just when I imagine I'm drained of all will to withstand this onslaught, I hear the singing. I hear the beautiful, unearthly voice of the maestri from Manaus, accompanied and floating on the moist air, filling the room with the sweet fragrance of melody. I close my eyes, the better to drink in the gentle balm of the song, and I find myself in a vast cathedral of light. The song has become light and color, the fantastical architecture of Dante and Blake, and I'm suspended from a roof of souls, a sky-arching dome of seraphic hosts. The visions are transmuting into miraculous, spiraling geometric structures, towers, tunnels, vortices, vortices, chambers. The clarity of the visions and the electricity of the colors are so alien to the experience of waking life as to be a different order of reality entirely. And yet to open one's eyes is to return to the room as it was. But these are not hallucinations. There is no distortion of visible reality. The colors and the visions are a separate reality projected onto the back of my eyelids. Closing your eyes transports you to this other world as real as any other, where sounds become light and light becomes color, and color turns into geometry, and geometry triggers memory and stories and emotions not only from your own life, but astoundingly from what seems to be the lives of others. I'm either dreaming awake or I am dead. I am a, in a bomber over a firestorm city at night. I'm in a longboat under a sail in a gray sea. I'm in a battle, and the thunder outside has become the roar of ordnance. I am deep underground in a filthy trench and there is someone at my side in the corner of my vision, almost like a shadow. I shall call him the companion. There are others too. The artillery barrage shakes, shakes the ground everywhere around us. The others are little more than youths in ill-fitting battle dress and steel helmets flecked with mud, fearful and shivering in the damp tunnel. I too am afraid and shake my head in an attempt to alter the vision. 
Suddenly I am in the town of my childhood in the north of England. I am a small boy, gazing at lists of hundreds of names carved into stone, watched over by two soldier sentinels cast in weathered bronze, their heads lowered solemnly over the stocks of upturned rifles. My child's hand is touching a cold metallic foot. The thunder and the barrage continue, and here I am back again underground with the companion, watching as those with him line up in an anxious file beneath the lip of the trench. Someone is coughing uncontrollably. I have a sense that when the guns stop, it is the companion, just out of my line of vision, who will give the order to clamber over the parapet into danger. I can taste the fear again in my mouth, as acrid and bitter as the brown liquid I have ingested. The ordnance suddenly falls silent. Every face is turned towards the companion, but I still can't see him. A faraway whistle blows, although it may be the call of a tropical night bird deep in the jungle, and then another, closer and closer all the way down the line. The maestri is still singing, beautifully, but with an occasional atonality, a quarter tone that is darkly disturbing and otherworldly. I, sen I sense that the companion has become still and rigid like one of the bronze statues, a whistle buried deep in his hand. Blow the fucking whistle, sergeant spits a furious anonymous voice and I hear more angry shouts along the line come on sergeant for fuck's sake they shout seeming desperate to kill or be killed and I'm st struck by the thought that some of them are too afraid to be thought cowards too afraid to step out of the lineage of brutality and cruelty that is as old as, old as history will you blow that fucking whistle but no one moves as the guns begin to rattle above ground and I know they are spraying death across the wire we hear screams of anger and agony. The companion gives no order and no one moves from the relative safety of the trench. The maestri holds a long suspended note hanging like a flare in the sky as a terrifying battle rages around us. I too am angry and confused. What the hell does this have to do with me? I feel as if I'm in some kind of virtual theatre, an experiment in reality or a waking nightmare, but one that I don't seem to be able to shake off. It is clear that the figures around are in mortal danger. Their terror is palpable and hideously claustrophobic. Yet at the same time, I have the unwelcome impression that I am the cause of this and being asked to navigate the realm of my own deepest fears. I sense too that I will not be harmed, but that I'm undergoing some kind of test. My head is spinning with questions, but I'm so astounded by the clarity of these visions that I'm unable to speak and unable to exit this other reality that is not my own. But there are levels of thought below these visions that observe and comment on them, and farther levels beneath those, commenting in turn to infinity. And where normal objective thought can give comfort, allowing the mind to step outside of an imagined or real danger, here the strategy only compounds the fear that there is no bedrock to reality, that so-called objective reality is only a construct, and this realization, I suppose, is akin to madness. Um, I'll stop there because it's a usually long passage, longer than I thought. But this is the way I begin the book, and it's not the way a, a normal celebrity um, bio begins. So that I was born in so and so. Um, th this experience um, is is like a death experience, and in many ways, oh, I assume it's like a death experience. It, it, my life flashed before me in this four or five hours I was in, in this trance, and. Um, I really had to reassess my entire life and it was ego shattering and someone like me needs that ego shattered quite a lot <laughs> to get back to normality and this story of being in this um, this, this battle um, ends tragically and it's it's it reminds me some somehow of my, of my mother and my, my mother, mother and father's tragic love story and then I begin to tell my my tale from from that so I, I was just struck by how much I wanted this kid to succeed, even though I kind of knew. <laughs> um, I, was, I was pretty sure that at the end he wasn't going to go back to junior year old. Um, and yet, I, there was this drive. You know, I, I wanted to know what happened next. And I was wondering if you had any insight on, I mean, I know lots of times writers just write intuitively, but I wanted to get any insight in what you were doing mechanically with the writing to create that tension and drive. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I wrote the book um, compulsively, and um, in uh, I'd write two thousand words a day, and um, when the sun came up, I'd start writing, and when the sun went down, I'd stop. But um, I, I would submit like ten thousand pages at a time 
to my um, I said something worse at a time. <laughs> Uh, to my editor in New York, and, and she would you know, respond. And then um, people have said that it's, it's a page turner. I think they say it on the back there. You know. um, I don't know. I just I just felt I was telling a story, and it had a shape, and I just wanted to entertain people and, and inform people and, and move people, because a lot of it moved me deeply. Um, I was forced to uh, excavate memories that I probably suppressed in the you know the sediment. And um, some of it was very painful to, to bring out, yet very important. And uh, some of it was you know, laugh, laugh out loud funny, and I enjoyed that. But it's like pulling, uh, pulling something out of a well. You, know, you pull one memory out of the well, and you lay it out there, and that memory breeds another 10. And those 10 breed another you know, 10. So um, my feeling was that you, you never really forget anything. Once you start the muscle of memory, it's, it's limitless. We, we are our memory, and so that, that's something I learned by writing the book. You, in the beginning of the book, used only I to refer to yourself and never did the other characters call you anything. And it's not until page 130 that we hear your name, and it is the name that we all know. It's not your sort of personal given name. Um, well, how did you think about doing that consciously as you were writing? Well, it's interesting. I was uh, christened Gordon by my parents, and I was never actually called Gordon. <laughs> I was, for some reason, I was always given nicknames as a, as a school schoolboy, and I'd have a you know, I was called Lurch at one point because I <laughs> thought I looked like the guy from the Adams family. <laughs> that was rather unkind, but or um, I was called Noddy for a while because it was Gordon backwards. You know, I had all kinds of different, and then I became Nosbert. Um, then I was christened Sting, I think I was 18, by a trombone player. And it's funny, you know, your parents give you a name, but they don't know you. They haven't a clue who you are. Your friends do know you, and they, so they, they give you a name that somehow fits, and somehow fits with your personality. And Sting, for a while, that was a pretty kind of um, prickly character. And, uh, I mean, that's my name now. It's a silly name, but you get used to it. My kids call me Sting. My wife calls me Sting. <laughs> so um, it's very cryptic. It's very easy to sign your autographs. But I've never really been called Gordon. And if someone shouted to me in the street, Gordon, I would shout Sting. I'll do the same. <laughs> I remember you saying once, I think a long time ago in an interview, that Stockport was uh, a terrible place bring up a child in, but not a bad place to bring up your food in. <laughs> and at the time, it, it, you know, also having grown up in a fairly unpromising place, it gave me great heart. And I wondered if in returning to, to your beginnings, to your childhood, that, that you, you found um, a different kind of complexity there from what you might have, say, had 15 years ago, or, or whether the writing itself complicated the childhood you had in some ways. Um. Stop, stop, what's not where I'm from, but I'm from Morsi. That comment, um, I thought was hilarious when I said that. It's a nice place to bring up your food. Of course, I wasn't thinking about the people who, li who still live there at the time. And I got into a great deal of trouble, um, particularly with my brother, who is still a milkman. He took over my father's milk round. And he says, you've no idea the trouble you've caused by s making that comment, you know. And then that pulled me up short, you know. I, I made that comment to some Rolling Stone journalist, and I was in New York somewhere. And, not thinking that the people at home would be offended by what I said. Of course they were. Uh, going back home is always complex. <laughs> it's always difficult. Um, since writing the book, though, I, I feel a much uh, closer empathy with the place that I rejected, the place that I left, and a love for it, and a love for the people who are still there. And in many ways, I'm grateful for that, I, and I don't, I'm not, I don't resent my childhood. I don't resent anything about my childhood. Even my parents' dysfunctional marriage, even not living in a wonderful place, not having a garden. I've learned to um, really give thanks because that made me who I am. And I, I have to love who I am. I have to say, well, this is me, warts and all. And, and it's because of my background, it's because of the setting I was brought up in that I am who I am. And without that, if I'd been brought up with a silver spoon or, you know, had everything handed to me on a plate, I'd be a different person altogether. So I have to be thankful for who I am. And I think the process of writing gave me that more than anything else. It's a gratitude for everyone in my life, including people who were seemingly my enemies or, you know, did me down. They, they, they worked for me, too. I, I like the scene 
where you describe um, meeting Stuart Copeland for the first time and, and playing together and improvising. And I wondered if writing about music was different for you than writing about other things. In the it's book. difficult to write about music, um, particularly when you think that most of your audience doesn't have the same kind of experience of music. You know, uh, I rarely listen to music for recreation. <laughs> I listen to music to analyze it, deconstruct it so I can figure it out. And that, that's any kind of music that I hear, even music in the elevator. I'm cursed with this thing and thinking, well, what's that interval there? Or what's that instrument? And what, what are they? Even the worst music in the supermarket, you're forced to analyze it. My recreation is just to listen to silence. <laughs> I don't listen to it. Uh, and I play it. But um, I'm, there wasn't that much description of music in the book. Yeah. But uh, I think I described uh, Stuart and I meeting like some kind of love affair without sex. <laughs> and that we were uh, attracted to each other musically in a, in a very sort of visceral way. And uh, it, was, it was a doomed love affair, but it was nonetheless a very successful one for the time we were together, seven, seven years. And uh, he's an amazing drummer and an amazing person. And he, he transformed my life. And I, you know, I hope that he, well, I know he does. He's very grateful for the book. He called me up and said, I, I, I love the way you've written about us. You know? It's about relationships. Music, music, music and relationships are very the same, the same thing. Shall I read another passage? And, and I've got to work here. Um, I mean, these passages were suggested by the professor. Uh, the guilty one. Let me see. Write them down. Um, oh, yeah, the... Page 196. It was interesting to, um, to go back and be the underdog again. I think it was, important. it was an important lesson to have had, particularly for someone who becomes successful to remember what it was like when you weren't. Um, I need my glasses. This is new. Hmm. To be a local support act is akin to entering an old pre-democratic subspecies of humanity that was thought to have died out with slavery. As a new member of this subspecies, your self-image is reduced to that of one belonging to a lower caste, a caste of untouchables, low-lifes, invisible men, and ciphers of minute significance. For the privilege of walking onto the big stage, however, there are few performers who haven't suffered this humiliation at some point in their careers willing to trade the denigration of their fragile egos for the vague promise of the spotlight and a few minutes of attention. The harsh facts, though, are these. No one has paid to see you. And the devotion of those who have paid is generally exclusive to the star of the show. This singular devotion, while flattering to the star, will preclude any chance that they will be interested in watching or listening to the local support act. More likely, they will be in the bar quaffing lager while you're bleating your heartfelt songs to a cavernous and empty room. As you now belong to the subspecies, you will rarely be ushered into the presence of the star or even those close to him but you will invariably have to deal with the roadies in this entourage in order for you to get your equipment on and off the stage as efficiently as possible. The roadies, generally nasty, brutish and short, to quote Hobbes, <laughs> know that they too are members of a lower caste, but not quite as low as yours. And this differential allows them to exercise that uniquely human characteristic of making your life even more a misery than is theirs. I have seen equipment thrown carelessly from the stage and swept aside like so much refuse littering a street before a royal parade. I have heard words that I'd hither, hitherto thought to be only apocryphal. Get that shit out of here! As the amplifier I've sweated and saved for is unceremoniously booted into the wings so that the star's pristine, high-tech equipment can be gracefully wheeled into place. However, not unlike lowly officials in the medieval church selling indulgences, it is in the granting of sound checks where these serfs can exercise their truly malicious power. <laughs> To walk on stage without having first checked your equipment is about as advisable as jumping out of a plane without having first checked your parachute. It needs to work. The sound levels need to be balanced, and you need to be able to hear yourself, as well as the other members of the band. This takes a little time. The star's equipment will have arrived at some point in the afternoon. 
The roadies will be ostentatiously tinkering with whatever seems to be the latest piece of technical wizardry to have arrived from the future. They will continue tinkering and posing with their scientific miracles until the star deigns to arrive to perform his or her sound check. The star is invariably late if he or she bothers to turn up at all, and the Hobbesian serfs will keep up the pretense of tinkering until minutes before the doors are supposed to open, leaving you little time to ascertain that your antediluvian technology is at least working. These are not the best circumstances in which to prepare for an important showcase intended to impress record companies. In this case, the star of the show, Alan Price, the keyboard alumnus from The Animals, has arrived and has commenced his sound check. He is dressed in an impeccable linen suit, cool and cosmopolitan, and utterly unapproachable. He is, of course, a local man, raised in Jarrow, but hasn't lived in the area for years. Mr. Price is an excellent musician, and he puts his band through its paces, changing a few arrangements, checking the monitors and the mics, rehearsing a new number. We're waiting in the wings, patiently seated on our equipment, but time is marching on towards the opening of the doors. He runs through the new number once more, and now there seems to be a problem with his keyboard, which precipitates more tinkering until the band can begin again. Everyone, of course, is oblivious to our needs for the evening as the clock gains inevitably upon the hour. When they begin the number yet one more time, Jerry and I begin to shuffle in our careworn speaker cabinets, staring anxiously at our watches. The Hobbesian serfs are looking at us with a smug, can't-be-helped expression. The master's at work. He can't be disturbed. When I'm witness to a sight I shall never forget. Frances was my first wife. Francis, who is up for the week from London and has been seated in the hall watching Mr. Price rehearse, is now leaving her seat and striding purposefully with her long legs and high heels towards the stage. She is still not visibly pregnant and is looking officiously at her watch as she mounts the stairs, a look that signals clearly that if the star's minions so much as think of impeding her progress, they will make a terrible mistake. Jerry and I can't believe what we are seeing, nor can the roadies. We all open-mouthed. She is certainly impressive, sophisticated, elegant, and not to be messed with. As she approaches the piano at the centre of the stage, I watch as her face assumes an impermeable mask of confident charm, and when Mr. Price eventually looks up, I can see that he is at first shocked, and then not a little intrigued. What the fuck is she doing, says Jerry under his breath. I'm, un I, I'm unable to answer, so fearful am I. Mr. Price is famously cantankerous. Even now he's trying to convince the muscles in his face to glower, but he can't quite manage it. So powerful is Frances' presence. She speaks to him quietly, out of earshot, and now pointing with authority at her watch and gesturing towards us at the side of the stage, Mr. Price is suddenly transformed from a glowering martinet into a compliant, eager schoolboy. He closes the piano lid and tells the band to quit the stage so that the support act can have a sound check. The sullen roadies cover their precious equipment in black drapes while Jerry and I gleefully carry the Hammond on, on the stage. We're almost dancing as we place it proudly in front of Mr. Price's piano. And Frances has now returned to her seat and I mouth the grateful thank you, I love you from the stage. We play as expected to a virtually empty hall, but there are some record company types from Island Records, Virgin and A&M sitting with Francis in the Royal Circle. We play extremely well and I ignore the empty seats and sing straight at the centre of the spotlight, imagining a throng of 70,000, which is okay until the end of the number, when all that, I, all that can be heard are a smattering of almost derisory handclaps. Mm -hmm. We leave the stage feeling pleased that we've done our best, while the hall fills up for the main act. A few minutes later, Francis arrives backstage with the record company people. We receive measured congratulations on our performance, enough anyway to make us feel that we haven't failed. You're definitely getting better, says one. Oh, yes, definitely better, says another. Yep, there's the third. And then there's an awkward silence which continues a little too long, but nobody feels like breaking it. Everyone starts taking undue interest in things like shoelaces and posters on the wall until the man from Ireland says, except we wait expectantly, except you, you didn't really get the audience going, did you? You were the fucking audience, says Jerry. <laughs> yes, he replies absently. I suppose we were. <laughs> He's sorry now, that bloke, I tell you. <laughs> it was good to remember that. Because uh, you know, we have support acts all the time. and I hope they're always treated graciously and, and given the time to actually do their job. It's important what they do. In thinking about writing the book, you mentioned that you wanted it to be more literary and you weren't thinking about these um, celebrity memoirs. Was there a lot of pressure put on you by your publisher to include photos at all? Mm -hmm. 
but how did you manage it? Well, you know, I, I, I canvassed uh, a lot of publish, publishers. I, I'd, I'd, written, uh, I'd written the first part, the um, ayahuasca. And um, all the publishers came, and they, they were all eager to, to uh, give me money and, and say, oh, we have to be your publisher. And, and I said, well, do you want photographs? Yes, we definitely want that. Well, that's not the kind of book I want to write. <laughs> Um, I want it to be a literary book, and you don't need a picture of uh, my grandmother or anything else. I mean, this, I found this picture of me. It's the only picture that exists of me. We didn't have a camera. As, this is a school photograph. I think I'm about nine, and it, it, it turned up. I just thought, you know, this is, this is what the book is about, not some rock star. It's about this kid. And um, I remember uh, the, my first book signing in New York. Uh, um, there was this, this picture was blown up about the size of this wall, and I, I became very emotional because I realized that I'd exposed this little boy to this madness. There was cameras, there was television, there was thousands of people wanting an autograph, and it, I, I felt kind of guilty <laughs> that I'd exposed this little chap to all of this. And of course, it's me, but uh, I, got, I can't really explain very well, but I, I felt very emotional and very weepy. It took a while to you know, come down from that. It's, t it's tough to reveal so much about yourself and to be scrutinized so closely, you know. And there's no privacy. So you have to embrace that and say, okay, this is me. You know, either like me or you don't. This is who I am. Do you like me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> opportunity to be in places that very few other people have been, such as the Amazon, all over the world. And I just wonder, in your role as an environmentalist and an activist, if you could give us some of your insights into what you think is going on in the world, what kinds of things are happening, because... My feeling um, about the world and about the environment um, is linked very much to levels of consciousness. You know. I think we're, we're asleep, all of us, and I include myself in this, in what we're actually doing to the world and to each other. And um, we need to be shaken awake, and I think we're going to be shaken awake whether we like it or not. And I think um, events like the, the tsunami, it was, a, you know, it was a natural event, but uh, you know, I was just on the island of Sri Lanka, I spent two weeks there. And, uh, the devastation was shocking. It was almost like a bombing run along the coastline. It's like a, like a precision bombing. And I saw 50 miles of it. Well, you multiply that by a few thousand, then you realize the devastation. Uh, in Sri Lanka, I noticed that 50,000 lives were lost in five minutes. It was mainly women and children. I met uh, a man who, who'd lost seven of his family. You know, it's extraordinary to, to be faced with that to look someone in the eye and, and realize the, the misery they're in. But at the same time, I found it inspiring that they want to rebuild their lives, you know. So I think we're all in for a shaking up. And the, the, the creeping, you know, um, pollution that we're all uh, suffering and th this government here seems to uh, just want to just make a profit. They just want to make a quick buck, and they're not caring about you know the wilderness, or they want to have you know six months of oil from you know destroying Alaska. It's not worth it, <laughs> and it's a bad. Co they have to wake up. These people are asleep. They're fast asleep, and they they're going to wake up. And I, I, but I'm optimistic. I have to be optimistic. I don't think it's too late. I think we can uh, we can get on track again by just being awake by what we're doing. But I drive a car. I travel in aeroplanes, you know, I, I pollute, of course I do, but uh, I, I'm trying to be as conscious as I can.